begin this evening with the confession of the Christian Bulletin. <laughs> Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean. That we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your boundless mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O oh, most merciful God, since you have given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy on us, and forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy on us and has given his Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on his name, he gives power to become the children of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. We continue with a responsive reading of Psalm 22. We will read it whole verse by whole verse. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I forgot that day, but did you not? Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, sworn by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me, they make mouths at me, they wag their heads. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you as I passed from my birth, and from my mother's womb, you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. And many wolves encompass me, strong wolves of flesh and surround me. They open wide their mouths at me, like a ravening and roaring lion. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far off. O oh, you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised the Lord and the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has served and divided him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, 
and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For he shall be lost to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow, bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. Glory be to the Almighty God, graciously behold this your family for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and delivered into the hands of sinful men to suffer death upon the cross. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Old Testament reading this evening is from Isaiah, beginning in the 52nd chapter. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what had not been told them they will see, and what they had not heard they shall consider. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, and shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle reading comes from Hebrews, in the fourth chapter. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy 
and find grace to help in time of need. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. This is the word of the Lord. You may remain seated throughout the gospel reading. The first of our readings comes from John's gospel, beginning in the 18th chapter. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, Whom are you seeking? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke, of those whom you gave me I have lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Then the detachment of troops and the captain of the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door outside. Then the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. Then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers who had made a fire of coals stood there, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Then the high priest then asked Jesus about the disciples and his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet, and in secret I have said nothing. 
Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. And when he had said this, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Do you answer the high priest like that? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. Therefore they said to him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Then Peter denied it again, and immediately a rooster crowed. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium, and it was early morning. But they themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but they they, they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. But you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Then they all cried again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber.
So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put him put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in the place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover in about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. And they delivered him to them to be crucified, so they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to each soldier a part, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said, therefore, among themselves, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things.
Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour that disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Therefore, because it was the preparation day, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. One of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear And immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen us testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he's telling the truth so that you may believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled, not one of his bones shall be broken. And again another scripture says, they shall look upon him whom they pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloe, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby.
be with you all. Amen. The sermon text for meditation tonight is the 30th verse of the Gospel reading. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Here ends the text. A fellow classmate of mine at seminary told me that growing up, he would be so angry during Lent. He would be filled with fury at Pilate, Judas, and the high priests. How could they have done what they did to Jesus? Until one day he realized that it wasn't Judas or Caiaphas or Pilate who was to blame for Christ's death. He was. It was his fault that Jesus had to undergo such suffering, and yours and mine. This is the purpose of Jesus' death, to reconcile the irreconcilable. It's like when a family has a quarrel or a fight and a loved one becomes estranged. This family member no longer comes to family gatherings or weddings or reunions. He remains unreconciled. Now these events, which should be filled with joy, have an undercurrent of sadness and alienation from this one that we love. We would do anything to fix this broken relationship. This is what has happened between God and us, except that it's worse. In the book of Genesis, Moses writes that when God saw the sin of mankind, he was grieved, pained at heart. He writes, and the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. God is not a static being or an impersonal force. He is a person who takes sin personally. At the fall, it was not just us who became alienated from God, but it was also came alienated from us. But even though God was alienated from us, he still wanted to restore this broken relationship. This is what Jesus does in his sacrificial death on the cross to cover the world's sin. Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit are willing to do anything to bring about reconciliation, to restore the broken relationship and heal the divisions which our sin has caused. The Father was willing to send the Son, and the Son was willing to take on human flesh and blood to cover your sin. This is what it means when Isaiah writes, For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. In the Passion account just read moments ago, it was you who was torturing Christ, not the Roman soldiers or the high priests. Your sins are what has brought about this event. When Jesus was tried before Pilate, Annas, and Caiaphas, it was you who should have been tried before God. When Jesus was struck, crowned with thorns, and nailed to the tree, you can be assured that this is your evil thoughts, words, and actions. For every nail that pierced Christ, 100,000 more should have pierced you. They should have pierced and pricked you forever and even more painfully. That is what we deserve. But Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians, if one died for all, then all died. In Christ's suffering, all people then suffered in him. As he hung on the cross, you all hung on the cross in him. As he died, also you too died, and as he rose, you all rose in him. All that Jesus does, he does in your stead and in your place to reconcile God to you. Jesus' last words was a victory shout, it is finished. He's speaking of God's reconciliation to you. You are redeemed and your sins are atoned for, covered up, not conditionally, but unconditionally. Christ has completed the reconciliation of God to the entire world. 
There's nothing left to be done in regards to your redemption. The Apostle John writes in the first epistle, Jesus himself is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Jesus' work of redemption on the cross finished the covering of sin, past, present, and future for all people. This is how Jesus reconciles the irreconcilable. God is already reconciled through Jesus' suffering and death. God is no longer angry at sin, which is why Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Even though you offended God first, he did not wait for you to come to him. Jesus took the initiative, reconciling himself to you first. And now he says, be reconciled to God. The problem is that by nature, we don't want this reconciliation. Reading and hearing God's law, we see what God demands of us. What God says that you should be in your deeds, words, desires, and also in your heart, thoughts, and disposition. It then becomes clear that our sinful heart hates the law of God with its demands and threats. We are God's enemies. We are not born basically good people, but in truth, hating God. During his trial, Jesus told Pilate, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Jesus, in order to reconcile us to God, to overcome our hatred, established his kingdom of truth. His truth is not just spiritual facts. It's not inert knowledge of his bloody work of reconciliation. Rather, it changes you. It gives you knowledge, but also at the same time, it transforms your rebellious nature, giving you the forgiveness that he has won for you on the cross. Jesus' kingdom of truth is the church. In it, he reconciles you, the irreconcilable. Through his word of grace and truth, he causes you to hear his voice, the voice of the good shepherd who willingly laid down his life for the sheep. Jesus then reconciles the irreconcilable. He first reconciled God to us on that Good Friday 2,000 years ago. It was then that Jesus, in your stead and in your place, suffered, was crucified, and then was raised. But he didn't stop there. By his death and resurrection, he also established his church, which is his spiritual kingdom. In it, he gives you his word, his gospel voice to change you by transforming your hearts of rebellion and hate towards God to hearts of faith and love towards him. And by this gospel voice, he keeps you and watches over you just as a good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. In the name of Jesus, amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
This evening we are doing the bidding prayer. At the end of each of the petitions, I will say through our Lord Jesus Christ, and you respond with Amen. Let us pray for the whole Christian church that our Lord God would defend her against all the assaults and temptations of the adversary and keep her perpetually on the one true foundation, Jesus Christ. Almighty and everlasting God, since you have revealed your glory to all nations in Jesus Christ and in the word of his truth, keep, we ask you, in safety the works of your mercy so that your church spread throughout all the nations may de be defended against the adversary and may serve you in true faith and persevere in the confession of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all the ministers of the word and for all vocations in the church and for all of the people of God. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is governed and sanctified, receive the supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all your servants in your holy church, that every member of the same may truly serve you according to your calling through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us pray, our Lord God Almighty, that he would deliver the world from all error, take away disease, ward off famine, set free those in bondage, and grant health to the sick and safe journey to all who travel. Almighty and everlasting God, the consolation of the sorrowful and the strength of the weak, may the prayers of those who in any tribulation or distress call to you graciously come before you, so that in all their necessities they may rejoice in your manifold help and comfort through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who are outside the church, that our Lord God would be pleased to deliver them from their error, call them to faith in true and living God and his only Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and gather them into his family, the church. Almighty and everlasting God, because you seek not death, but the life of all, hear our prayers for all who have no right knowledge of you. Free them from their error, and for the glory of your name, bring them into the fellowship of your holy church, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for our enemies, that God would remember them in mercy, and graciously grant them such things as are both needful for them and profitable for their salvation. O almighty everlasting God, through your only Son, our blessed Lord, you have commanded us to love our enemies, to do good to those who hate us, and to pray for those who persecute us. We therefore earnestly implore you that by your gracious visitation, all our enemies may be led to true repentance and may have the same love and be of one accord and one mind and heart with us and with your whole Christian church through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We remain standing then for the reproaches and for the singing of the hymn verse following each. Thus says the Lord, What have I done to you, O my people, and wherein have I offended you? Answer me. For I have raised you up out of the prison house of sin and death, and you have delivered up your Redeemer to be scourged. For I have redeemed you from the house of bondage, and you have nailed your Savior to the cross, O my people.
Thus says the Lord, What have I done to you, O my people, and wherein have I offended you? Answer me. For I have conquered all your foes, and have given, and you have given me over and delivered me to those who persecute me. For I have fed you with my word and refreshed you with living water, and you have given me gall and vinegar to drink, O my people. Holy Lord. Thus says the Lord, What have I done to you, O my people, and wherein have I offended you? Answer me. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? My people, is this how you thank your God, O my people? be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We give thanks to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who accomplished the salvation of mankind by the tree of the cross that where death arose, their life also might rise again, and that the serpent who overcame by the tree of the garden might likewise by the tree of the cross be overcome. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. 
This is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
pray. O God, the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. 